Good afternoon, everyone. It is my honor to introduce to you our next guest speaker, who is joining us virtually. She is from New Delhi, Indonesia, uh, India, sorry, and is a fellowship and learning coordinator for the Western Himalayan Youth Fellowship at India and Bharat Together Foundation, which is now called Magshala Foundation. That works empowering rural youth in the Himalayas. She has a master's degree in psychology and education and has an anthropographic research background in the area of environmental education. She is also an alumna of Delhi University and KU Leuven, the latter where she was an Erasmus Mundus scholar and an IRO scholar. Today, she will be talking about the importance of communities to participate in the making of knowledge, sharing examples from a global project called Grounded Imaginaries. She will take us through climate change efforts of grassroots communities in the Western Himalayas to build new possibilities for living that are sustainable. Let's all welcome with a round of applause Ms. Vayakal Palanyapan Janu Sambavi. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. And thank you to Maristella for inviting me to this wonderful event. I'm really looking forward to engage with all of you through this presentation and share my experiences on the Grounded Imaginaries project as well. Thank you so much. So just allow me a minute to share my screen with all of you. Is my screen visible to everybody? If you can, then please just give me a thumbs up. Yes, we can see it. OK, thank you so much. So first of all, thank you for being a part of this presentation. I'm really honored and privileged to bring this idea of grounded imaginaries to a new part of the world and share it with all of you. I'm looking forward to what you think about this and what ideas you want to share with me through this presentation. I um, Please feel free to share questions or raise uh, your hand, or if you want to interrupt me at any point and get clarifications on anything I'm talking about, I would love to have a conversation in between as well. Right. So with that, I would just like to welcome you all to this seminar. And let me introduce myself a little bit more. Um, I was working as a learning and fellowship coordinator for this particular project, Grounded Imaginaries. And uh, as part of this uh, organization called India and Bharat Together Foundation. Now, how I was associated with this project was that I helped design this program and also facilitate it and as well as monitor and evaluate it. So from the beginning, I was associated with this project and it's a project about climate change and helping uh, youth and communities from rural areas in the Himalayas become a part of how we understand climate change in very simple terms, in terms that people from the villages and small towns of India can understand it, which is not uh, mixed with jargon or very complex words. It's something that people who are very uh, semi-literate can also understand. And we wanted to develop this kind of understanding about climate change. And this was uh, the whole project and the motive behind the project, right? And what does India and Bharat Together Foundation do? And as the name suggests, it's about bringing India and Bharat together. Now, what is Bharat? Bharat is the Hindi name for India. And we often connote Bharat uh, with the rural India, the, the part of India which is less developed which requires more opportunities, more awareness, more mentorship in order to bring it at par with urban India. And right now, this is often not possible because the urban India gets majority of all the opportunities, while the youth and the communities in rural areas suffer a lot because of lack of privileges and lack of opportunities. And this organization is a social enterprise based in Delhi, which is trying to bridge the gap. Right. And coming to what is citizen science and how all of this is uh, connected to climate change, why am I bringing the climate change lens inside this? We know si citizen science is for everybody, 
right? It's when the public voluntarily helps conduct scientific research through experiments, through surveys, they could be collecting data, they could be doing all kinds of studies and different kinds of activities to support scientists. Today, with the climate change lens, I want to show how communities in the Himalayas who are in very remote areas, hardly connected by any form of communication or transport, they can also be participants in creating knowledge about how they live, about how global warming and all the impacts of climate change are impacting their communities. They may be very far away from the scientists, the policymakers, but it does not mean that they do not have a voice. It does not mean that they do not have a presence in this whole uh, debate and discussion around climate change and how even those people who are living so far away remotely can become tools, become um, a bridge for um, you know, bringing together ground realities and scientific research. They do not have to be at the margins. They do not have to be on the sidelines always. And this is what we are going to discover. And I will be sharing more case studies from this particular project. Okay, um, so what are we going to be covering today? We'll be discussing the where, which is Western Himalayas, and where is it located? What kind of climate change impact is being felt in this particular region? And what are the kinds of imaginaries that are dominant in relation to climate change in the Himalayan sphere and in the global sphere as well? And why do we need a fourth imaginary? Now I will discuss what an imaginary means. What does it mean to imagine? And what is the outcome of imagination, which we are calling an imaginary? And lastly, we will also be discussing some case studies. I will share some podcast with you, a video that was made. And through that, we will try to create an, an engagement around this topic. OK? Um, these All these images that you see are from the project. These are people who actually live in the Himalayas, who actually participated in the project. So, so this is, so let's first look at the location. Let's look at where we are, where you are. This top circle, it's where the Western Himalayan project was being conducted. This is the area of the Western Himalayas. And it, it comprises of three states in particular, Uttarakhand, Ladakh, and uh, Himachal. And we will be focusing mostly on Ladakh. And this is where you are. This is how far we are away from each other. But through the course of this presentation, you will all see that the impacts of climate change experienced in the Himalayas are not just restricted to the Himalayan region, but they impact the world. They impact everybody around us. And so we are all in it together. So if you have questions, I think you somebody will have to uh, raise a hand or let me know because I cannot see everybody else's videos actually. So um, so the administration can help me with that if anybody has a question in between or if anybody wants to interject me in the middle, please feel free to do so. Yeah, I have the microphone ready here for who wants to ask, ask anything. Yeah, so it will be available to you throughout the presentation and at any time, please feel free to do this. OK, so you've already seen the geographical location of the Western Himalayas. But let's look at it from a climate change lens, that what are the problems being faced in these regions? There's, of course, it's an annual event, these natural disasters, the floods, the cloud bursts, the landslides in this region. It's an annual occurrence. And it's become so common that people are not even paying attention to it in any way anymore because it's so remote. It doesn't even come in the news at times. And that's how far removed from reality we are. That's how climate injustice happens. That if you're away from the center of action, the problems that your community faces, they don't even make it to the headlines. And it becomes something normal. It just becomes, that's how the place is. That's what the people go through every year. There's a big problem of melting glaciers. Every year, with the rise in temperature, these glaciers are melting at a faster rate. And it, it's a big problem because 
the glacier needs to melt at a certain time of the year to allow for irrigation to allow for the proper filling of the water but if it is always melting then there's never enough water stored for the people living in the villages there's also irregular precipitation which is the irregular rainfall that happens and in fact even right now india is facing summer it is supposed to be summer right now but all we have is a, a sudden rainfall it's been raining in india and it's not the time for rainfall and imagine the impact on a farmer who's who's expecting sunshine at this time his crops are supposed to receive sunshine at this time but it's receiving rainfall this farmer will lose all his crops simply because the precipitation didn't occur at the regular time and this is what is happening to farmers all over the country more so in the himalayas because they depend on rainfall they don't have artificial irrigation systems there and of course the deforestation as well is happening in the himalayas because they want um, fancier lifestyles um, in the plains so they cut a lot of the wood from the forests in the himalayas and uh, this is going to affect people living in the himalayas first and then the rest of the country will also be affected gradually because the ecosystem of the whole country and the whole world is affected by these kinds of things uh, with that i want to go into what are the imaginaries it's clearly something important that the way we are living may not be the best way to live in harmony because this is the earth we have until elon musk figures a way for us to move to mars this is the earth we have all of us have to do uh, you know make uh, possibilities to live here in harmony we can't think of alternatives and we can't think of moving to another place not just yet right so all we have are these imaginaries and what does imaginary mean it comes from the word imagination and before we start to live in a certain way we start to think here we imagine what an alternative way of living could be could that life be lived more in harmony with nature with the plants with the forest with the trees with the animals with everything that we uh, with that we share our world with could we all live in harmony and that's what an imaginary is to think about a different world to live in a in a new way and how can we do that and who will uh, think about it whose job is it to think about living in harmony does it is that the job of governments or ngos or environmentalists or activists or all of us are we not part of this um, process are we not impacted by it should we not be part of the team that makes all these imaginaries and this is the point i want to um, emphasize that it's not just the job of experts to think about living better doing better it this is the stuff that matters to all of us and all of us have a right to think about it but at this point there are three dominant imaginaries in climate change which is of course you must have heard about it denial point blank denial there is no problem there is no climate change and we would hear this from the likes of donald trump for example who would say there is no climate change where is global warming there is no evidence for it he says and that's the stance taken up by a lot of people that we can con continue to use our resources the way we have been there's no problem this is all just mumbo jumbo it it's not real there's another group which says no we have some impact of climate change but then technology can fix it that's what musk would say he would say that we can have technologies that can you know enable a different form of life a different way of living um it it will uh, it will fix it there's no problem we can do it we are so advanced that technology will you know overcome all the challenges that people have to fix there's a third group of people who say apocalypse that means doom that we have gone too far already things have become too difficult and 
we have used too many resources. Now water will be only available for 10 more years or the coal will finish in another 25 years and it's going to be the end of all. And those are the three dominant imaginaries in the climate change space. But we need a fourth imaginary. We need an alternative to all this. We cannot just rely on these imaginaries because we need to move beyond. We need to think of another way that allows us to be participants in creating a better world where citizens can do something about it. They can dream, they can imagine, they can try something, they can actually act to save this planet. And for that, we need citizen science. But I would all um, ask you to uh, ponder over this question. Why should we involve communities in research? Why does it matter? If, if anybody wants to say it on the mic or if there's another way for me to get that from all of you, please share it. Yeah, they cannot answer in the chat, but I can just give the microphone. Around, yes, yeah. if, if it's easy then. Um, hi, Sam. Um, hi. My, my answer would be that uh, because the communities are, uh, are also the end user or should be also be the end user of our findings. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Anybody Someone else? Someone else? Yeah, we have one more. Because whatever the impact or the result of our research, it will affect the communities. So they have a stake in whatever we do in the research process or in the research outcomes. Thank you. Exactly. Exactly. I completely agree with that. Sam, can you and see us? Yes. If anybody else wants to answer. Okay. One more person. I think one uh, factor would be that uh, they can be the source of uh, the solutions to the problems uh, they encounter in the community. Right. And we often see that communities are given instructions. They are told what to do to you know, resolve their own problems, as if some expert from the outside is going to come and save them as if they are not capable of solving their own problems. And this project is showing that, yes, communities have the capacity, they have the intellect, the creativity, the skills to help themselves. It does not have to be like a savior from the outside has to come in with his expert knowledge and share what uh, he or she knows with the community. They are self-sufficient also. right? And one of the problems... Um, that is often seen in solutions or the way solutions are made and created is that top-down knowledge is passed down to people. The policy makers and scientists rely on knowledge that is already there, created in very scientific ways, and then they pass it down. But the ground realities may have changed in that time, or the nitty-gritties may not even be reflected in those very broad forms of knowledge-making processes. The small things are often missed, the details are often missed in these representations and hence they are not democratic solutions. The solutions that favor the perspectives of a select few who have the power but do not have the full picture, the full vision of how things are at the ground level. And this is a problem. This is a big problem because when we start implementing these solutions, they fail at the ground level. They are not accepted by the people whom it's supposed to help because it does not take into account the perspectives of those people who are supposed to benefit from it at the end. And therefore, communities need to be at the forefront. It's not just because it's virtuous or a feel-good factor for communities to be a participant in their own decision-making. This is vital so that we do not waste time or resources in, in this process, because if everything is top-down and rejected at the bottom, 
who's getting benefited? Nobody, right? So the next is how can ordinary citizens contribute to building knowledge? And I would request Maristella to again pass the mic if anybody has any answers on about this. What can we do? What powers do we have? What capacities do we have to build knowledge? I think citizens can contribute to knowledge building by sharing their personal experiences and as well as their personal thoughts about Definitely. the subject. Yep. Any other way? So lived experiences are extremely important to building knowledge. What else? Um, they contribute by sharing their current issues happening in their community and within themselves. So uh, in that way, we know uh, what is happening, the actual happening uh, on a smaller scale in, uh, in the community. Yes. So keeping up with the current events, very important. Any other way? Hi, uh, by, by collecting data themselves, they can be asked to collect data for your own research. But I, I think you can extend more than that. You can capacitate them on how to do citizen science. Definitely, because there's some data that is very difficult to collect by somebody who's sitting far away. Even if they have the latest instruments, sometimes they're just too far away. So communities definitely help with that. And I think another thing would be, well, uh, since they've lived in the area for a period of time, they've built uh, knowledge about the area. Uh, aside from lived experience, there is also cultural knowledge, traditional knowledge from the elders of the community that's handed down to the generation. Absolutely. And this kind of knowledge is often not passed down to the younger generations because they sometimes are far too removed from that lifestyle. And who's going to tell the, the next generation or the scientists if this knowledge gets, uh, you know, diluted or extinct? So it's really important for us to go back to the elders and talk to them. And we can only do that by going to the places where they reside. It cannot be done sitting far away from them because often they are not in a, in a position to be able to share it in other ways that young people are equipped to do. So, yes, very important for... Uh, everybody that we respect the knowledge that the elders bring right and these are some of the other ways that uh, citizens can contribute to knowledge by simply observing what's around you and reporting it it's very clear when there's too much rainfall or if the snow is not melting at the time it used to melt in march but now it's happening in april that's simple observation then people can also attend consultations Sometimes policymakers hold these consultations with the local people when they are about to build a dam or when they are able to start a road construction project or when they are able to start um, a different or maybe a hydroelectric project. And they hold consultations with local communities. And it's a duty of communities to come and share their perspective. They could do research on their own. They could you know, choose to be informed about what's the latest happening. So this is at the level of understanding. Similarly, there are many things that they can do at the level of reflecting and taking action. And each person has different capacities, different talents, different levels of interest in engaging with a particular issue. Some people just like to make networks or maybe just discuss things. Some may actually would, you know, they wouldn't want to go and um, collect data. They may want to even resolve certain key problems faced by the community. Some may like to actually mobilize people to let's you know just say uh, a group of people come together and say no we are going to solve this water crisis problem or we are going to find out why our lake is contaminated uh, with pollutants we are going to find solutions so everybody will have different levels of engagement and in all these ways climate science happens 
there's no one way to go about it all of these possibilities exist when we decide to be a part of the change process okay and with this idea with with this plethora of options available to us we started the grounded imaginaries project so how did this uh, this project come about let me just share a little bit with you this is not just a project of india and bharat together iibt is not the only member this is a project in collaboration with the university of sydney and the social entrepreneurship association in the south of india so these three organizations came together and said okay there are communities that are in these areas which are being affected by climate change what stories of climate change can they share with us by observing analyzing talking to each other and also the kind of solutions that they are trying so this this project happened in three different sites in the south of india in australia and in the western himalayas but i will be sharing mostly about the western himalayan context but if you want to look up the project there's uh, i will be sharing links later and you can see all the other uh, sites as well where this project happened and the idea was to showcase how communities are facing the problems of climate change and what models of change are they developing what are the imaginaries being created to adapt to climate change at the local level and highlight them so that they become an example for other communities to take charge of their problems and do something about it if this community can do something why not another one and what did they do what processes were part of making this change happen so the idea was to highlight these stories highlight their experiences and show how it's done and these three partners came together to do that and let me just share a little bit about how we did it we selected six people six youth fellows from these uh, from the western himalayan region so that was iibt and six were selected from australia by the australian team and six were selected from south india from the oroville team and so these six fellows from each of these sites received training and mentoring and this was done so that they are able to do some kind of research to document stories of climate change how it's impacted the communities on the ground and what models are being uh, you know uh, are in practice Uh, in these regions to mitigate the effects of climate change or adapt to it in different ways how is the community learning to respond to the challenge can we stay just passive when uh, our water resources are declining we will not have drinking water in a short span of time so the community is doing something actively to work towards it and the idea was to highlight them to bring them to the forefront because the communities sometimes the communities may receive help but it may not be the right kind of help but often there are many inspiring and exciting solutions that the community comes up with its its own meager resources that show that community power is real they have so much capacity to show their knowledge they have so much capacity to help themselves why not bring it out and this was the idea behind the fellowship and these youth belong to the himalayan region they are not from outside the idea was also to help them in their career if they want to pursue climate change and become leaders in this area and uh, many of them have gone on to do many interesting things and we can discuss that later as well so these were the three sites in the western himalayan region where these fellows were engaged one was the pishu village in ladakh there was a kevad village in uttarakhand and sarmoli village in uttarakhand as well right today i'll be as i said before focusing more on ladakh in the, this particular village pishu because it's a cold desert very remote very far away from the mainstream and very severely affected by the impact of climate change but yet it's the bedrock of creativity of resilience of power of the community so i really want to share this with you this story of resilience and capacity and the dream to do something different in their village okay so just sharing briefly a little bit about pishu village here but i would like uh, later to show a video about the pishu village and the problems that are being faced by the people right 
So let me just share that uh, Pishu is one of the highest inhabited places. Um, it's it's a cold desert where there is uh, very little transportation because of snowfall. It's cut off from um, the mainland for most of the year. There's extreme cold. And uh, the people just basically are farmers and they resort to uh, very um, primary occupations. There's not a lot uh, of possibilities to do the kind of thing that are possible in the plains because of the remoteness, the harsh environment, the, the challenges of living in a place like that. So they are doing what is possible for them. Um, and the climate change has made it even more difficult for them to live because the increasing temperatures have made the glaciers melt faster. There's not enough snowfall collected uh, that will allow them to have irrigation. There's also erratic precipitation, which means that the rainfall is very erratic. Sometimes it's a lot, sometimes it's less. There is no seasonal balance. There's no seasonal cycle that is being followed anymore because of that. And due to this, the community is forced to move away from these places. The, there are many villages which are becoming ghost villages because there's no water any, anymore. They are forced to move to other villages where water is available. There are many places where the tree cover is vanishing. And many people who are farmers at one point on, when at one point in time have no other occupation. They have nothing to do because there's no irrigation possible anymore. There's no water source. So what do they do? So that's, uh, that's in just some of the problems. But um, I think it will be better if we look at a story um, of... Um, of the community this is created this is a video which will share the perspective of the community on the ground on what they are facing and uh, i would like you to really connect with the story and let me know what you feel what does um, this story inspire within you at the end of this so let me just share this video with you So allow me to just share this. Is my screen visible? Okay. Is the audio okay? Everybody can hear it? Okay. On the highland of Zangskar, the inhabitants are accustomed to coping with shortages, whether it's the power irregularities, patchy roads and discomforts of all sorts but never have they ever faced acute water shortages in recent time. The village of Pishu consists of 29 households and agriculture is an important feature of its landscape. The winter snowfall on the mountains of Pishu is of vital importance to crops irrigation. With less snowfall this year, the village is going through yet another agricultural drought. पहले तो हमने देखा तीन चार फीट बहुत बहुत ये प्राप्त जमा देखा सर्दियों में 
और बहुत सालों से तो काम ही काम ही आ रहा है पानी नहीं है तो पूरा लाइफ ही पहला तो पानी पर ही डिपेंड होता है पानी नहीं है तो मुझे लगता है कि और कुछ नहीं है छु तायो हमपुर हमपुर फी ओना समे नलके
I'd like to make a small comment for the participants. You could also, just to give an idea, you can also make some video like that for Saturday. Just giving an idea. Yeah. So I would like to ask all of you, what did it make you feel? I think uh, I can uh, by watching the video. Uh, I realized that uh, climate change slowly killing small communities and the uplands. And if we are uh, going to do nothing with it about it, if we are not going to uh, uh, involve, uh, no, uh, you know, other other communities, especially those who are. Uh, heavily affect, affected of this climate change uh, slowly uh, as what I have watched they are slowly abandoning their areas and it will slowly kill the culture uh, there and maybe in the future the song that I have heard ju just heard right now maybe it can be sung in the future if we are not going to do about it, I think. Absolutely. Um, hi, Sam. Uh, this hi. is just out of curiosity, like, um, is landslide uh, prevalent in random places or there's just like a hotspot location? Like for example, if you go to Himachal Pradesh, which is, there are a lot of tourists um, visiting there. So it's mm -hmm. still a safe uh, destination to visit? So yes, landslide is always there in the mountain areas, but it's more during the rainy season. So I often go to Himachal Pradesh myself and uh, but it's often advised that do not do that during the rain, rainy season because that's when the chances of landslides are higher. But the uh, rest of the year, it's fine. It's not a dangerous place as such. But like I said, you know, when natural disasters strike, you never know what, uh, you know, what's going to happen. And uh, 
the frequency is just increasing every year. So if you want to travel, I think the best time to do is when outside of the rainfall. So beyond the rainy season, that, that would be still much safer. But yes, it, it is a problem in, in all of the Himachal and the other adjoining mountain areas. But I would not call it unsafe yet because we go there still and uh, it's safe enough to travel. But yes, just avoid the rains. And I also would like to pose another question. Th there is one more person. Just to... Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Sam. Uh, that's a very Hi. interesting video and it shows how vulnerable our communities from climate change. And there's no de denying it. Now, uh, I, I just have one question with regards to the problem of water scarcity in the uplands. Are there any interventions from the government? Because I only see water conservationist group who have this um, particular in initiative with regards to the problem. Yes, so there are many campaigns from the government as well. For example, uh, there was a very big, and it's still going on, there's a big river source called Yamuna and there was a big project called Save the Yamuna because it provides water to a lot of areas in the plains and the government has been making efforts to revive, you know, places which, uh, which have water, the, you know, protect the rivers from being further contaminated and clean the, uh, clean the sources of water or, that are already polluted. So those uh, issues and uh, those things have been taken up by the government. But you see, on one hand, there's the government effort. And on one hand, there's the private interest, which is uh, the private interests are those that just dump chemical waste in the rivers. You cannot have uh, one group of people protecting the rivers, reviving the rivers, and another group constantly contaminating it. So there is this tussle between the two, even though the government is putting a big effort in changing. But often this effort is in areas where there is protest, where the people will be in big enough numbers to put the pressure on the government. But what about these kinds of villages which are very far off the grid and you have seen the landscape, you have seen the geography. These are people who are not very powerful, they cannot make their voice heard through the media agencies, for instance because they are in very remote villages. Who's going to help them? So there the government action and interventions do not reach fast enough. And that's why it's a problem because justice delayed is sometimes justice denied in a sense. Because if you give them the water 20 years from now, what's the use when the whole generation has already gone through so much, when they've lost their culture, when the children have moved on, migrated, there's no point in giving a solution so late. And that's the problem, the problem of time in these areas. We need urgent action in these places and that's what's missing at this point. Uh, yes, Sam, I would like to ask a question. Uh, yeah. you, you mentioned there that the warming, the warming in that place is higher than the global average warming. So what's the reason? And then secondly, I noticed that the solution, I mean, the effort right now is something, I don't see any, I might be wrong, no, but I don't see any conservation effort. It's more of sort of utilizing the water, provide supply water for the villages. Well, mm -hmm. that's good, but am I right to observe that as of the moment, there is no conservation effort to increase the supply of water? So, so there to, are two, to, two, yeah, two questions, uh, yeah. answers to this. Yeah. And the first one, it, it's not that the temperature increases higher, but the impact of the temperature increases higher in these areas because they are around the mountain regions. So if the glacier melts, they will be the first ones to be affected by it. The flooding will happen first there and then it will reach the plains. And these will be the people who will be most impacted by melting of glaciers because their occupation, which is farming, is immediately dependent on the glacier melting. They are immediately, you know, affected by it. A lot of people in the urban areas can go to drier places. They can move. They have more mobility. But people here are just immediately dependent on nature for their survival. So any increase in, um, uh, you know, the water levels is going to affect them. Any glacier melting is going to affect their food cycles 
they will uh, uh, not be able to survive because the few because of the food security will be threatened so that's one uh, the second the efforts of the government are often misguided in these areas so the focus is on bringing jobs to these places by increasing tourism for instance and now more tourists mean more consumption of water in an area that is already struggling for water so there is more road construction happening because they say if there's more roads there there are going to be more job opportunities more industry industries are going to take an interest in this region but that means more people coming in and more people means more pressure on the existing resources so there is a lot of misguided um, development work that is happening in these places the second thing is that we cannot have more water brought in from somewhere the, this is the source of water for everyone so all that we have to do is protect this place as it is and the water levels will automatically increase we just have to stop human activity from interfering with nature we do not have to bring it from somewhere else and that's kind of the attitude often in urban areas if one source of water gets over we get it from somewhere else but people who are you know dependent on um, the only source of water available to them they don't have alternatives the only alternative is to migrate to another place the, it's not a possibility for them to bring water from somewhere that would be too much effort in a desert that's spanning miles and miles with no decent modes, modes of transportation that won't be possible because it's very difficult to travel in these areas very harsh climatic conditions it, it the oxygen level is very low in these places so there's mountain sickness and those kinds of issues so it's not as easy to you know um transfer things and materials and resources as we imagine in the plains so the only way is that we stop interfering with nature and the government supports conservation efforts more and more and does things in a timely manner and redirects its development efforts to save the water first so so there is a very urgent need to bring the perspectives of the people and the perspectives of the government on the same page and and these videos can be a means for these discrepancies to be brought out to the public because the government is thinking we are doing a good job we are giving them roads we are giving them all kinds of facilities but basic water is more necessary than everything else thank you yeah do we have more questions or comments Yeah, so far nobody okay and i also want to point out can you imagine the tools available to these people would be very different from the tools available to some technologically advanced country so when we think of scientific research we are so used to doing thinking about it in the realm of experts who have all the resources we forget that there are communities that have very basic things with them but they also need to uh, be able to use what they have and these outputs are simple raw videos they don't have hi fi technique you know technology behind it they don't have very fancy editing behind it it's done on smartphones you know these two fellows were from ladakh they went to the interiors of the region they talked to the people they interviewed them on their smartphones and they created this video in yet you can see how the people are affected by climate change yet you see the issues that are being affected and my point is that you don't need to be very resource rich to be able to bring out these perspectives that citizen science can happen in the most impoverished areas as well as long as we put to use the resources that we have already we have one question mhm mm yes Um, hi Sam. Um, I think hi. I would say I'm sorry to ask this question, but um, do you have any other data to back up that what is going on in the place is really a result of climate change, or is it actually a temporary phenomenon in which there's a change of season? Now it's a dry season, and then it's wet season later on. Okay, sure. Uh, there are two kinds of studies that are done. 
there is a, a very popular university in the Himalayan region that is that has been conducting studies for a long period in that area. And later on, I can provide you with links or resources to those studies. But later, I'm also going to share a podcast with you where a person in, who's now a director of an NGO, and this is the same person who was mentioned in this video, Lob Zhang Wang Tuck. So Lob Zhang has been studying this phenomena over the years. He's, a, he's someone who was raised in Ladakh. He's someone who calls Ladakh his home and he has been observing the changes. So there is anecdotal experiential evidence as well as scientific evidence to back this change. And in the podcast, you will hear people talking about this change as they have seen it through their own eyes, growing in this region as a child, as a youth, as an adult, and seeing the things that have uh, transformed around them. So I'll also share that. Yeah, does it answer your question? Yes. Okay. So going back to our presentation. So as we saw, there is a big crisis happening there. And of course, some people would say it's normal. This is just change that is um, that is normal, it's to be expected, but th there are studies that are also showing that no, this is a serious crisis, that there are real consequences of this crisis in the form of, um, that we will discuss later, but the ri right now the crisis is about carbon suit that is uh, being set in the glaciers, it's not clean water anymore, there's a lot of, um, you know, um, elements that come from the pollutions, the pollutants that are uh, destroying the atmosphere, it deposits in the form of black carbon suit in the glaciers. The amount of time the glacier should stay in frozen state, it's that's not happening for a long time. It melts much faster. There's also rampant tourism because it's very scenic, very beautiful. I mean, as you can see the visuals, they are very gorgeous. And if you go to the lakes, there's crystal clear blue water and very popular for, uh, you know, tourists. And every year there's more and more tourists coming to these places. So the crisis is only increasing because they use more and more water. They're not used to the energy efficient ways of the local communities because the local communities know how difficult it is to get water from a far off place, right? And the consequences are that when the villages are not able to get water from the glaciers, uh, either there's too much water or there's too less water or water available at the wrong time. So the irrigation doesn't happen at the right time and that affects their food cycle as well. And secondly, they have to go for a, like, long distances for miles together just to be able to quench their thirst. And the zinc, the reservoir where the glacier melt would be collected is dried up. So that's just making it more and more difficult to sustain their lifestyle in a particular year. And then what do people do? They just migrate to another place or they wait, hoping that the next year is going to be different. And they try short term solutions for that. But is that going to really change life for them? These short term solutions are the way forward or because even the spring from where uh, the pump is generating water right now might dry up later because the glaciers are melting or there's not enough ice that is being formed. The glaciers are not uh, present like are not in a frozen state for a long time and the water just melts and goes towards the plains. There is no water collected in the villages. So how are they going to survive? That's the question. And we saw that they have identified the pro problem. The people of Ladakh can see there is a water crisis and that's the first because when these kinds of problems start people often dismiss it. They may think, oh yeah, it's a temporary change. Maybe next year is going to be different. Maybe, you know, we'll manage, we will survive. But when people start talking and reflecting and saying, no, this is becoming an issue year after year, and we are losing our youth to cities. We are losing our best brains to other places. Nobody wants to stay here anymore. Then people start discussing. And that's the first step that you come together and identify a problem, an issue, right? And then the next steps happen, whether you want to share it with other people, 
do you want to bring together a group of people to do something about it and take action and you can make your choices some people would just identify an issue on their own then they'll try to experiment maybe they'll collect data maybe they will write to official agencies other people will choose to just share knowledge it's it's up to each of us to choose whichever path we want to take up and now i want you to listen to somebody who not just identified this issue but brought it one step further and he took a lot of action and i'm talking about lob zang wang tak who is a pioneer water conservationist from this region and i just want to want you to listen to this one man's perspective about how he went about doing things how he sees this particular problem and what is the dangers of uh, being indifferent to this what are the problems that can come in the future if we do not take action today is the audio good yes okay. yeah this is the source of all life for me 40 to 50 million years ago when india drifted apart from the gondwana land and crashed into asia forming these mountain systems and creating the habitat for these glaciers to form you know and from there downwards life trickled down and civilizations came along these rivers so i just wanted to add one little thing it's a slightly longer podcast so i thought we could come up with three questions that we would like to reflect on in the later part of this seminar and if you have uh, something to note down this on maybe your mobiles or some paper or something that would be great um the first thing i would like you to all focus on is the values that communities bring when they engage with issues of climate what values do communities bring the second thing i want to i want to pay attention to is the kind of actions that they take what actions are possible for the communities when it comes to engaging with these issues and thirdly what do you think will be the impact of this change that is happening of of the crisis that is happening within the himalayan region and in the rest of the world how will it impact a place like philippines for example so we could come back to these questions as we go through this podcast it's slightly longer but i'm sure it will uh, open up something that may you know that will that was hidden and that was not too visible before Several millennia later this very life that trickle down continues to uplift support and nurture people and nature alike we travel northwards across the evergreen forests grassland plains and deciduous jungles of the indian subcontinent towards the soaring peaks of the himalayas a place of immense importance to the entire country yet seemingly disconnected in both time and space I am Ishika Ramakrishna a wildlife biologist and science communicator with a deep love for storytelling today through an introspective conversation with two young individuals rooted in Ladakh We will try to understand how local communities from the higher reaches of the Himalayas have been experiencing and adapting to the increasingly real consequences of climate change. Lobsang Wangtak, glacial conservationist and co-founder of Navikarna Trust, an NGO, and Dawa Dolma, an independent journalist striving to bring the people's stories to the forefront of climate change discourse, join me. to dissect what is happening in Ladakh today. 
Let's begin now with Lobsang, introducing us to the isolation of Zanskar in Ladakh, where he grew up. It's a 7,000 square kilometer um, of area uh, which remains cut off from the rest of the world and even from Leh also, it's adjacent town. Uh, for six months, you can't really get into Zanskar or out of Zanskar other than walking on the frozen river trail that takes about a few days, sleeping in caves and walking on ice just to get into Zanskar and out of Zanskar. This form of disconnect, though, isn't just geographical. It seeps into the lives of the people who call Zanskar their home. This, coupled with rapid infrastructural changes, also means that the people have seen an evolution of culture and environments within a single lifetime. When I was born, there were uh, almost no cars or vehicles we could see around. So once in a week, we would see one vehicle and we would run to the road uh, to chase it. And we actually initially thought uh, they were animals too, you know. These rapid changes were not limited to the interior villages of Ladakh alone. The effects of development, coupled with environmental changes, could be felt even in its central town, Leh. Leh today seems like an adolescent uh, who never got some guidance because the, all the, the negative examples you can find in Leh and it's a classic example of what not to do. Here there were very, uh, you know, limited vehicles at, around that time, right? But now the amount of, you know, vehicles are like, uh, if, uh, if I'm not wrong, a study is uh, actually shown by the uh, regional transport office says that it's actually seven times, uh, you know, like higher than it used to be, right? Wow. So that's uh, pretty interesting in the sense that uh, it's not only about, uh, you know, the society as a whole as uh, we don't have any plan, right? There's no like uh, proper plan. So whatever development is taking place, it's so unplanned. It's actually harming the, uh, you know, the environment and the society at large. Lobzang, having grown up amidst these changes and concerns, was both driven and action-oriented. He chose to go back to the root of Ladakh's crises and co-found Navikarna, an organization that works towards mitigating climate change. We started Navikarna in 2019, so 2018 we were still figuring out okay, how to go about it, whether to work with the government or not. So before that, um, we need to go back in 2014 when I understood that there are communities and villages which are facing acute scarcity. So there were, we were looking for solutions uh, that were already uh, trialed and tested. So at that time, artificial glacier as a concept, as a, as a design was pretty popular. So this started in later 20th century, uh, in the beginning of um, the 90s. But the technique was already uh, experimented in the 80s also. So 1991, if I'm correct, was the first time uh, Padmashi Tsawang Norpal was able to implement that design in a village which was facing scarcity. So it worked. In an artificial glacier, you are making use of the wastewater uh, in the autumn or winter when it's not used. So usually you have a spring source or stream source that is much less than in the summers, but anyway, it mixes with the river or it goes underneath the ground, but the villages and the farmers cannot use it, you know. So it was like um, the, the problem started when snow pattern became very erratic um, uh, later in the 20th century, and early 21st century also. Many of these villages had run out of their uh, snow fields or the glaciers, small glaciers they were dependent on. And because um, it didn't snow much in the winter, so uh, there was nothing um, that was lower than the real glacier and they could use in the first irrigation period because there was nothing to melt. There was no uh, snowfall, little to no snowfall in the winters. So uh, this technique was trying to solve this 
particular period. So in the summers, peak summers, it's very warm, you know, so the glacier, whatever little le left in the higher up peaks in glacier, that would melt. But it was usually at the end of April or beginning of May when the farmers need to um, uh, give their first irrigation water. And not that, only that um, they had to also humidify uh, the fields before they start tilling earlier because of enough snowfall, because the ground is also uh, frozen. Uh, before tilling your land, that was enough to humidify your fields, you know. So, and then third thing, because of the warmer climate, the snow lines of the peaks are also elevating, like uh, receding further. So it's even harder uh, for this to melt in the initial period when you need it most. So if you miss out on the first irrigation, what do you could expect? No cultivation, almost zero. Um, and this was the particular problem they were trying to solve, and we were trying to solve in my own village and some other villages also. Then, as I understood uh, more, the bigger picture, you know, in 2015, we went to collect some um, snow samples uh, from the glacier, Stongde Glacier, that's my village. We have a pretty large glacier uh, compared to other villages. And we went up there to take samples to understand what kind of particles are in there. And uh, we sent it to a laboratory also. So what we found, um, we brought back 20 liters of the snow, uh, melted it at a lower elevation, and let it filter through a filter um, uh, process. And we were surprised to see within the first or second um, filtration, the, the filter got clogged. Now, usually, a, you know, a pure, transparent, uh, clear uh, snow melt would actually go through it like at least seven, eight times before it gets clogged. So we could see with our own naked eyes. So there were dust particles, different types, sand also. And surprisingly, even in 2015, we saw layers of carbon suit, black carbon suit on it. Then I remember sitting there the entire night, I was just wondering, 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 and curious about like, okay, so this phenomena of black carbon suit on the glaciers and more quantity because we hear from people, you know, the glacier or the snow looks much darker than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. It used to reach all the way down here and now look at it, you can't even see it. So these are like observations and people's experiences and which cannot be denied also. You know, then, uh, then I understood like, well, if it's receding at such an alarming rate, on top of there's no, there's no precipitation that uh, helps in accumulating these glaciers. And there's so much particles and black carbon suit, which will make this glacier even more susceptible to melt because it's eating away the reflective layer on these glaciers. You know? So then I was thinking, well, many of these villages have much lesser glacier than this. You know, we can keep making artificial glaciers, um, but then what happens five, 10 years from now when this glacier is not there anymore? You know, then you won't have the spring water or the stream water that you use for making artificial glaciers. So right now, the technique is wonderful in solving that problem, it's a, but it's not a solution. It's the band-aid solution that we applied before a very severe uh, sickness or severe injury. Why focus on Zanskar though? Is it just that Lobzang grew up there? The largest freshwater reserves in all of Ladakh can be found here. 80% of this water originates in Zanskar itself. It is the epicenter of the massive glacial river that ultimately flows in three separate directions, being most voluminous and plentiful in Zanskar. But what does this mean? A global temperature here, this rise could be doubled or even more. When we look at an ecosystem which serves as a bounty of freshwater reserves, one degree Celsius could change a lot. After all, the difference between ice and water is only one degree.
and so we need to ascertain how many meters of ice we lose for every degree rise in temperature. But more important so, to every village you see in this high altitude ecosystem are dependent on a snow field or a tiny glacier. Today these are disappearing. So within a year you will have villages after villages facing drought. And I'm not talking about a scenario 10, 15, 20, 50 years from now. This is happening right now. In Zanskar today, this year when I visited, talking to villages, we were documenting all that. There were 23 villages which were facing mild to severe scarcity. And we can only begin to imagine how detrimental this water scarcity crisis will be for future generations growing up in Zanskar. You know, if I follow the conventional uh, way of going about life in the community in my life, uh, getting married is uh, on the top. Okay, so imagine myself getting married and having a family, looking after these figures, having my own house, and then with my brother sharing those lands, sharing those water distributions also. I saw more and more conflicts in my future. We have four brothers. <laughs> we were to share the water day with four brothers, somewhere or the other you will have this conflict and understanding that, well, it's going to get more severe and I'm going to part, be a part of that community. And in 10, 15 years, I don't see these glaciers lasting. And it's the same with so many other villages also. So when we talk about bigger picture, then we need to talk about sustainable contextual policies. And uh, when we talk about that, it's not about launching organic farming schemes or uh, cleanliness drives or, you know, just about waste management mechanism. It's not that even when we talk about regulation of tourism, everything at the core of it, what matters is water system and glacier system in the Himalaya, which is misunderstood. When we understand these glaciers, when we understand this water system and how communities interacted with these resources and why villages were only, um, you know, always depend on the glaciers because it's a different context. We don't have monsoons. Uh, the vitality of this Himalayan region are its glaciers and not just for us, for downstream communities also. Fertility of soil in the plains. And in a way, we are talking about, um, you know, if this glacier reserves run out in another 100 years or a few decades, then it could mean an a issue of food security of the whole world because these plains, uh, especially the northern Indian plains, are most fertile and uh, contribute a lot to the food uh, security of this world also. You know? And how all of this is interconnected. Having a healthy mountain ecosystem means healthy monsoon in the plains. And um, before we reach a tipping point, it's better to uh, first actually address and define what's the fragility of the mountain ecosystem. You can't talk about carbon neutrality and organic farming very really little scales and uh, have exponential growth of vehicles coming into this region. You know, you cannot well, this is going to keep growing. So before that, we need to define, okay, there are so many freshwater reserves and there is an impact of this black carbon suit that is being settled on the glaciers, which is going to exponentially um, grow the rate of loss of these glaciers. And when we make the glaciers relevant to the world as large, you know, it's not just our problem. We need to see it's, it's a global issue. We don't look at micro pictures. We look at the micro picture. At the same time, we make it, um, see the macro bigger picture also. Continuing along the search for adaptations and ways to mitigate immediate consequences of climate change, Lobzang and his team came across another solution, the ice stupa. The idea is similar to artificial glacier, but here you're using a pipe to bring down uh, for a few hundred meters and uh, using gravity and letting that water gush out in the sub-zero temperature. So the um, significant difference between artificial glacier and ice stupa is that ice stupa has much lesser surface area and it's in a conical structure, so it lasts longer in the summers. 
So I tried that also, but then, as, as I said, I saw it as more bandaged, short-sighted solution. These are not solutions, these are adaptations which are band-aid. From here, we can zoom further in to understand the cultural implications of climate change. In a system this complex, nothing functions in isolation and drastic environmental alterations manifest in people's daily lives. The way we interacted with the water system was very, very spiritual and uh, highly respected. So you would never contaminate water in any form. If you who are, you are not even allowed to wash your hands near to a, a, a spring, you have to go further down. Uh, you cannot cut any plant without, you know, asking for forgiveness. You cannot build anything uh, before you put an axe to the ground. You have to do certain rituals to ask for permissions, uh, ask these spirits which are the water spirits or the ground earth spirits, you know. It also helped in maintaining that really fragile interaction with the natural world. And it was really mutual respect. And uh, today it's sad to see the people seem to not care at all. There's no faith. Um, so one year of garbage that has been collected in the in the house it cannot be dumped anywhere for segregation or there's no recycling unit so you go near a bridge and then throw it in the water you know earlier you would be you would fear that there'll be consequences you know you would get bruises you would uh, be sick for so long uh, it's we believe like there are uncountable number of uh, lives that are residing in within the space that we are in there's not, there's not even one step you could take without uh, you, you, there's no way you won't find any form of life, you know. There are form of life and many of them not visible to the uh, naked eyes also, but that doesn't mean you don't, uh, they don't exist. So that, that respect and that knowledge uh, seem to be also lost, which is sad thing to see because, um, it's happening immediately within generation um, because we don't grow up in the communities. We don't seem to inherit and inherit this um, this belief and knowledge systems. And within one generation, we lost whatever has made us survive in this the harshest conditions. Today, people know about these places only because there's a road. But our communities for generations have been in the harshest of the conditions and the only way they could survive was this mutual respect they would share with nature. Apart from the in situ effects that climate change and glacial melts have been having on the people of Zanskar and Leh, these phenomena have also given rise to several climate refugees who are simultaneously at the mercy of their immediate environs and local governing bodies. I can only uh, talk about, uh, you know, the eastern part of Ladakh, right? The pastoralist communi uh, community of Ladakh, the nomadic. Uh, uh, what happened there is, as uh, you know, with lesser snowfall every year and then uh, drying up of those uh, highland or pasture land. And, uh, and also, it's interesting, I think, it's not only... We can just say that this is entirely due to climate change, but then it could be because uh, we are uh, also uh, seeing an angle from uh, education, uh, right? Because uh, the <clears throat> the children of nomads are actually getting access to education, but uh, those are like <laughs> uh, not well received, uh, you know, education from. Uh, you know, various institutions. So what happened is like there's a generation gap between the one who adopt the uh, community and then the younger one are uh, not re really willing to continue or to sustain the life of uh, nomadic, right? So what happened is that then they have to relocate or resettle to somewhere else. So they need to, so especially in Choklam, sir, the place where I live and I'm surrounded with those people. So 
uh, just uh, behind uh, my camps, right, we have people from Karnak, which is also a prominent, used to be a prominent, uh, you know, <clears throat> nomadic area. And we got a lot of resettler here. And then uh, down uh, below us, there's another um, area which is called Tokling. Also, most of them are uh, resettled from the highland of Korsok. So I think uh, I can I can only tell from that way. But then it's interesting, especially uh, for Tibetans and nomads, right? We got a few of them uh, in Changdang. And for them, they become a double refugee because they are already uh, politically, they're, uh, you know, seeking refugee in India. And now they are, you know, uh, becoming uh, climate refugees uh, because uh, they no longer, uh, you know, continue the la life of uh, their ancestor, right? So uh, that could be, uh, and then that gives a pressure in the, the urban area, let's say, <laughs> let's call this an urban area, because uh, right now, like when I was uh, small or young, right, uh, the places uh, that I live, it's actually empty. There was n n no one, no, no one living, especially like from host community. Now that uh, it's already packed with, uh, you know, people coming from Changdang or people coming down from, let's say, Nubra, and then we also got some from Zanskar. So I think that adds up to maybe uh, uh, the phenomena of, uh, you know, uh, climate refugees. I want to uh, stop here is it, because it's a pretty long podcast. Now the couple of minutes to go, but I will also be sharing these links with you and you can see all the other episodes as well from the other places but going quickly uh, to some of the questions can you what resonated the most with you can you when please you repeat at, the question yes what resonated the most because we went through a lot of experiences being shared by the by the director by Dawa, who was one of the youth fellows in this fellowship. What do you think is the most urgent problem that the community is facing? Because we went through a whole list and I want you to just imagine yourself living in a place like this, a cold desert with seven to eight months of remoteness, no connection to the mainstream. What do you think is the most important thing for a person living there? Hi, Sam. Good afternoon. And, Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for for presenting um, a very significant topic. Um, I'd like to raise a point, but I'd, I will answer the question you raised. Um, maybe this is not a time that uh, we maybe tone down a bit a discussion on climate change. Mm -hmm. Because the climate change as a concept is very political. It sounds political in such a way that it goes, it, it suggests that it goes beyond us. Like the power, the capacity to make things happen, to change and even help communities. Because um, global commitments of, of leaders across the world, they do not commit in decreasing the temperature of the world. We joined the COP26. Um, I am part of the global assembly who facilitated the, the representation from Asia. And it's, it's quite fascinating that there are a lot of communities affected by climate change. And then we made a position, we made a stand to negotiate with world leaders. And then they did not commit. So um, it's, it's, it's a wake-up call that maybe the concept of climate change is so political that it keeps us away from the position of power, despite the efforts to negotiate and to lobby. And maybe to answer the question, maybe this is now the time that we just focus on what we can do with our communities. So um, if, I, if I understand the question right, I think um, what needs to be addressed now is, for, for example, issues of survival. There are vulnerable communities. Uh, we have to address their vulnerabilities. We have to source out um, resources that we can extend. For example, national resources uh, um, or even policies, uh, policy infrastructures that make things happen for them. For example, projects, um, environmental projects that 
um, assists or even addresses their vulnerabilities. Um, maybe to, to, to end my answer um, or to end this um, input, uh, I'd like to put forward that our actions should be to address the vulnerabilities of our communities because that is something that we can do and maybe we can do things better if we reduce our ambitions to some things that are more tangible and more practical. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you for that input. I think I also want to add a little uh, dimension to the idea of the political. We often think politics resides in the politicians. That this political agency that we say, it's, it's only in the ministers, the policymakers, the advisors, the ones who hold uh, positions of power in the ministry. But I, I would like to expand the idea of the political to anybody who, who has the capacity to make an impact. And that includes the community as well. Though we, we may not uh, consider them as part of the ministry or the government, but when a person decides to make a point, decides to stand up for their rights, they are making a ripple in the ocean. They are making a point. And that capacity to make a point is what makes the whole process political. And as long as communities refuse to accept that, they refuse to accept the lack of commitment from the politicians that they have elected and they decide to step up and make their voice heard, they are going to be part of the political process. Nobody can push them out of it in that sense. But they have to make persistent efforts and we have to encourage this process to keep going on because by themselves, as, uh, as the director Lob Zhang Wangtuk also says, they can only create adaptations, band-aid solutions. It cannot happen in isolation. It requires the support of bigger bodies like governments, uh, you know, and uh, agencies and NGOs and the whole ecosystem has to work together. It, you cannot just put the uh, responsibility of conserving water and changing the impact of climate change on a small vulnerable community in a remote part of the country with very few resources to survive on its own. You, you can't uh, put the responsibility of a global problem on a local community. It's an unfair thing to do. It has to happen in tandem with each other. And that's why these communities' voices have to be on the you know, forefront so that they are not drowned by these loud voices. But going back to the question, I would uh, just like to ask, with all these litany of problems that was shared, what do you think would be the most important one for, let's say, a a uh, 20 year old living there a young a youth from these places what would be going uh, what would be going in their mind what what concern would matter to them the most because there's a problem of farming food security there's a problem of um, uh, you know water security livelihood cultural damage there's a lot happening so what's urgent and that's something that a lot of policymakers have to figure out what needs to be done immediately. So I would like to pose that question to you, all of you. Not sure whether I, I got your question, no. But uh, am I am I correct to understand that I would put myself in the shoes of the community or just my observation? So, if you were a twenty-year-old youth who was part of this region, what would be your topmost concern? Let me put it that. Uh, well, of course, my my immediate my immediate needs. So, so Walter. Uh, food security, something like that. But as far as the solution is concerned, mm -hmm. I'm not very sure if I'm a 20-year-old guy living in that area would see if there's a global impact on the, on the amount of snow uh, falling in that area, which is, I believe, is the sole source, the only source of water, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. 
that's true and as as your question itself says when you look at something from an outsider's perspective you may value different things you may think th- this is a bigger problem and when you look at the same problem as a person who's residing in that particular place a different problem might be more urgent to you and that's one of the challenges of pro- problem solving that who decides these solutions who decides which problems need addressing first and when it is in the hands of people who are observers and they are not experiencing the immediate impact of these problems the kinds of solutions that come up can be very different and that's just something to keep in mind to bear in mind when we look at solutions that are being created and in the latter part of the podcast which i've uh, stopped for now and i would really encourage you to look at that uh, lobzang also talks about the government intervention and how that's shaping uh, the dialogue how it's affecting the people and some of it is misguided and that's creating additional problems in the region as well right but for the sake of time at this point i would just like to uh, just uh, check with if anybody else has uh, any inputs or comments on what we just heard and then we go on I think you can go on. Okay. So in this we see that the band-aid solution that Wang Tuck talks about is the pumping of water. through renewable energy from a local spring but as we know the spring is also dependent on the glaciers and once the glaciers dry up completely they are finished the spring is finished and there is nothing uh, from where they can pump water then what option do they have except to migrate to another place so this is an imaginary that works for now but it can only survive long term if more deeper thinking is going to go into it and the government and all these agencies are going to put in their resources to support uh, better solutions that can work long term there can be no solution long term except that the glaciers do not melt but how do we do that that requires more concerted efforts efforts not just of the community but of the world powers to commit to reducing all the global temperature changes that are happening commit to reduced pollution and better management of resources so that's one of the imaginaries and uh, like this we came up with imaginaries from each of these sites from sydney from uh, south of india and from the western himalayas and you can see in these pictures the the solar cells that are that are there used for pumping the water the water pipes and how the people are going there to collect the water and like this we had like you saw you just heard the podcast we had different kinds of outputs from the fellowships that would show the problems being faced in each of these villages and it came out in the form of a short film which we which we just saw the podcast which we heard just now there are also articles poems uh reflection videos even instagram reels and there's a there's an animation video also from one of the places and all these are small simple outputs created by community community members to showcase what they are going through in the form of climate change so that this thing that we call very political it's residing in the hands of very powerful politicians whose lives are not ultimately so affected by these changes we keep complaining about that but then what can we do here sitting here that that can actually you know share this problem to a more wider audience what can we do sitting here to create more awareness of what the people are facing and these are different from what um, scientists might do these these kinds of outputs are not in the form of say journal articles or newspaper articles they are different they are more they are more the kinds of outputs that everyday uh, you know people have the skills for these are things that a common man can do and the idea is to expand the research and the research output to alternative media and not just restricted to written form in journals and 
bring it out in different kinds of formats and working with the community is a very different ball game it's not the same as um, a scientist going and studying something on his own when you when the community decides to work together and come up with solutions and does it in collaboration with the scientific community it's not a straightforward thing there are many challenges and opportunities also that are part of this and um, for this i would like to look at a different site going from ladakh i would like to move on to sarmoli which is a village in uttarakhand also in the western himalayas and this uh, particular project which was also part of the which was also covered by the grounded imaginaries this is a story about the people of sarmoli village and in this village there was a pond which was called the mesar kund which was drying up and the people came together to uh, to you know dig into this pond which was all dried up and revive this dried up pond so that they have water source so this was a different solution compared to what the people from ladakh did they uh, revived the water by digging up but they, there was a lot of clash in the digging up because there were traditional stories associated with this pond that women should not go there and especially women who menstruate should not step into this pond because if they do then the whole village is going to be cursed and this is the only water source for the people around this place there are two villages which are completely dependent on this water source and what they had to fight against was the pond drying up and this was not immediately connected to um, the kind of issues that ladakhi people are for example going through this was more connected to the local uh, changes it was not connected so much to um, the immediate global issues but it was there was a lot of local issues also that were involved in this particular water crisis and um, this was a very monumental thing for people to come together for women to break the taboos to start digging and to challenge the patriarchal idea that women ca can't step out of their homes especially menstruating women and they can't be near sources of water and it was challenging a lot of taboo ideas and then eventually with the effort of the community coming together initially it was just a few women but later it became a mass movement where people started coming in and seeing what efforts they can make and slowly it became a movement where they started digging more and more until the until the pond got revived and today it is celebrated as a form of environmental conservation festival which happens every year in this particular village in sarmoli and there are a lot of additional activities like they they uh, award people who have made conservation efforts in the region there's a lot of song there's a lot of dance there's sports there's yoga there's a lot of uh, activities related to nature harmony conservation efforts and that's celebrated every year it's going to happen this month in fact and but it all began when the people when the women particularly in this village decided to do something about their only water source because without this particular pond they had to they had no other alternative means of water except going to far off places to collect water and that used to take a lot of time and so by sharing the story i want to share that the idea of um, collect you know protecting the resources is not just about the technical uh, the technical idea the the issues related to you know scientific uh changes around us that can be observed through uh through instruments you know like a 1 degree increase or a 2 degree increase in the temperature it's also about the ways it affects the society how does it impact the lifestyle of a woman if she has to go for kilometers or miles to just be able to fetch water and this particular example this case looks at the story of climate change from a more social angle that how the cultural factors also play a big role when people decide to you know conserve their water and when uh, these uh, so they made an animation video about this whole transformation process and some of the things that came up while discussing while interviewing the women who were part of this um, re lake revival the pond revival process was that a lot of people at the local level were very unhappy with it because 
they felt that their culture of not allowing women to go there was being challenged there were people who said there are certain caste members uh, who should you know who, who should be away from such places there are political bodies who are affected for example this this particular lake this particular pond uh, is surrounded by two particular villages and the village bodies were claiming rights over the pond and they said this should not be uh, you know dug up by the other village and there were certain problems related to that there are certain agendas related to the water like some want to protect it uh, from the women some want to protect it from drying up so that it can be used by the villages so there are internal differences like this within a particular community related to the same thing there's also issues of legitimacy that who is allowed to go near a water body who's allowed to dig uh, dig the uh, the pond who's allowed to act in what way around a particular resource and these are issues that are that a community has to figure out on its own when some policy advisor from a far off place comes and studies it for a day or a few days he may not be able to grasp all these things when defining the solutions but when communities engage with solution building in their own levels these kinds of issues also crop up so there is challenge on one hand but there's also opportunity on the other hand when we involve communities we get to hear the folk stories around these for example in creating this animation video uh, we got to know the names of some of the story uh, from we got to know some folk stories that people didn't know particularly the names of the characters small details that were part of the folk story that people knew in bits and pieces but the gaps there were there were a lot of gaps in creating these videos people started talking about it sometimes people would just sit together and start talking about the history of the place they would start singing and they would create songs related to the culture to the place there were new kinds of collaborations that were emerging within the community and the experts while we were in the uh, process of making this animation video so the process of research is very very constructive it's not just about uh, rebuilding what was there in the past it also leads to new kinds of collaborations it builds new kinds of knowledge which is which is uh, which can be very different it can be in the form of cultural knowledge it can be form of uh, historical knowledge it can be in the in the form of scientific knowledge and uh, the only way to do is when people come together when we choose to keep a certain section of the society outside of the knowledge building process the kind of knowledge that emerges will look very different democratic spaces create space for different kinds of knowledge as well and i would just like you to all uh, just uh, watch this particular animation it's the way that, that the community members created a story and a song to showcase uh the revival of this particular pond so the song that you hear was created by the women of sarmuli can you all see my screen yes yes we can see So this was just an example how when a community comes together 
what is the form that they will uh, use to you know show their knowledge if th- in this particular animation they talk about how their village is surrounded by the panchachuli range it has the bugyal uh, grassland around it and this is a way of sharing the culture the landscape the geography of their place and w- what it means to live there and this song encapsulates their song their music their culture of singing and these outputs show things in a very different way compared to what somebody who's read uh, who's you know from an outside perspective would write about the same place and so that's that's the advantage of you know having the community on board as well and with that i would just like to thank you all for your patience and would just like to uh, direct you to these contact uh, emails and addresses if you want to know more about this project and if you want to just follow up on some of the other things that we've been doing in this particular project thank you so much if you have any questions any feedback please please share it with me thank you sam It was a great presentation. Is there someone who would still like to make a final comment or or make some question? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to affirm what you said uh Sam about uh let's not put the solutions everything on the on the on the community itself because the if the effect of global warming is a global you know i uh, it's not it's not it's not the community whose fault but the polluters outside that community and so if we would really put the burden on the community to solve the problem of course they have a role to play but if we would solely put the burden on the communities that's what they call climate injustice right yes yeah so yes i believe that what you're doing the advocacy thing one has to be very aggressive on that to really make the voices heard to the people who are responsible in causing the global warming exactly why why should the people who contribute least to these problems suffer the most <laughs>